good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my title, the title of my talk is Dynamics of Biological Systems, a Perspective on Systems Biology. Uh, some of you know me, I'm a professor here in the Department of Biology with secondary appointments in neurosciences and biomedical engineering. I've been here for a while. And uh, Miranda, uh, who took Bio 300 uh, a little while ago, um, thought it might be interesting for the society to hear my perspective on um, systems biology. I, I want to say at the outset that I have my own particular prejudices and biases about what I think systems biology is and should be. Uh, I will try to be fair to other views, um, but I want to warn you in advance that I do have my own strong opinions on this. Uh, you're welcome to ask me questions about other approaches that you've heard about or, or thought about. Um, but I think it's uh, useful to hear my perspective and then make sure to supplement it with other speakers who might have a very different perspective. And I hope uh, if I'm inaugurating that, that you'll have a whole variety of different speakers who provide uh, different viewpoints. Okay, so just to outline what, where I'm gonna go so you get a sense of where we are in the talk. First, I'm gonna ask the question, what is systems biology? I'm gonna tell you at the outset, I don't know the answer, but I will give you a quote and say something about what I think other people think it is. Um, so I'll spend a little time on that. Then uh, I'll give a brief overview of how I created the, the, uh, the course Bio 300, which was in a certain sense, the first, I think I could say the first systems biology offering in the biology department, and then how I work with others to create a major in this. Um, and then I'm gonna spend a little time, hopefully we'll find this not too, um, uh, not too uh, boring, but I, I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about how you use systems concepts for understanding the dynamics of a neuromechanical system. So I'll talk a little bit about my own research. Uh, and then I hope you'll find this very exciting. There's uh, systems biology is uh, really a wide open frontier. There are lots of really exciting problems. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about the ones that I've thought about a lot and briefly mention a few others and then wrap up. I am highly interruptible. Um, so if someone, something I say isn't clear, uh, something I say uh, doesn't make sense, please stop ask me a question, I will be delighted to answer it. And I will periodically pause uh, as I go through the presentation. And if there are things that I think uh, you might wanna ask more questions about, I'll give, give you space to do that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's embark on this, this voyage here. So what is systems biology? So I looked it up. There's a nice article on Wikipedia about it. Um, I've also read various articles, but I found there was a nice quote that I liked uh, by a guy named Ron Germain, who's at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, he actually works in immunology, but he's played a, a significant role in trying to get people to uh, uh, do systems biology at uh, NIH and elsewhere. Um, and uh, he says the following, a scientific approach that combines the principles of engineering. Let's see, uh, my screen here is, is covering part of what I wanna see here. Can I move that? All right, let's see. Uh, let me go back. Uh, engineering, I think uh, mathematics, physics, and computer science with extensive experimental data to develop a quantitative as well as a deep conceptual understanding of biological phenomena, permitting prediction and accurate simulation of complex emergent biological behaviors. So um, there are several things I want to focus on here. Notice that he mentions engineering, math, physics, and computer science. He also mentions experimental data. He then mentions two uh, key things, a quantitative understanding and a conceptual understanding. And then he sees this, the goal is to, pr to predict and accurately simulate. And then he mentions this concept of emergent biological behaviors. So I think the reason I like this quote is it actually combines a lot of different things that I've seen people talk about in systems biology and I think articulates well what the issues are. So let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the ways of thinking about it. And the broad thing that I want to start with is in thinking about biological systems, you can take really two big approaches. One is you can do analysis and the other is you can do synthesis. So let me explain. The reductionist approach, which has been incredibly powerful, still very valuable and very important, is let's take pieces apart and see how each of the, what they're composed of and uh, perhaps figure out all the different components and work down to the, to the lowest possible levels. So first, as you start looking at biological organisms, you notice that they're made of organs. There's a heart, there's a kidney, there are lungs, their liver, and understanding their functions is very important. 
they're made up of cells. And again, uh, if you go up to your close friend and says, hey, you're made up of trillions of cells. I'm not sure how excited they'll be that, that you're regarding them in that particular light, but it's true. Um, and understanding the cell is already an amazing thing and recognizing that we are made of cells is a very important advance. But then the really the big revolution that occurred in the middle of the previous century was starting to focus on the molecules. And molecular biology has been an incredibly powerful way of understanding what's going on. But the difficulty is, and anyone who has done uh, this kind of thing um, knows if you take a complicated machine apart, at the end of the day, what you have is a lot of pieces on the floor. Um, when I was um, a nine or 10, I took apart a clock. It was a mechanical clock. Now, if this is, a, I'm old enough that it wasn't a quartz clock. And uh, I actually got the mainspring out. And then I had all these pieces, I had gears and I had, and um, my dad was always okay about my taking things apart. My mom was not so enthusiastic. So uh, with some concern that she might be upset that I had, now the clock wasn't working. So I felt it was all right to take it apart. I, I thought she would be less likely to get upset at me. But I really felt that it was really important to, um, you know, maybe restore it to its previous state. So I spent quite a bit of time struggling to get the mainspring back in and then put the gears back in and it actually worked. Um, so that was a sort of a primitive example of analysis, taking it apart to pieces and then synthesis. And again, the reductionist approach has been incredibly powerful. But what's happened is people have recognized that at the systems level, even if you have a description, a listing say of all the cells and all the molecules, there are properties that make the functioning system very interesting that aren't captured by that listing of those components. And the question then is how do you understand whole, how the whole systems work? And that's, that's where systems biology becomes very important. Um, and just a few examples. It's one thing to have worked out all of the um, key enzymes that are part of the Krebs cycle. Uh, and, you know, very, very important to understand which cofactor is important and which enzyme and whether it's uh, there is uh, end product inhibition and all those other things. But what actually matters about the Krebs cycle, which is in the center of intermediary uh, uh, metabolism, is how the cycle actually works under certain conditions. When you've just eaten, when you're starving, when you're pregnant, um, all of these things, they change and they change in a dynamic fashion. So understanding molecular networks is not gonna come just from knowing the names and the properties of the individual molecules. Similarly, there are cellular networks. The immune system, of course, is a very important one, which has a coordinated responses to uh, foreign invaders. And of course, the nervous system is another example of the cellular network. How do these work? Again, knowing all the molecules and even understanding the biophysics of individual ion channels doesn't tell you about the dynamics of the entire system. That, that somehow doesn't, it's escaped your, your fo focus if you just break it down to pieces. Of course, we talked about organs, but for example, how the heart and the lungs uh, are, are properly regulated so that you can go from running to walking to lying down and sleeping and it adjusts to all the different needs um, seamlessly in general. How does that work? That again is a, is a systems level kind of question. And then of course, as you go beyond the single organism, you get to ecological networks and you begin to realize that you're talking about these multiple interacting complex systems. So systems biology then is actually addressing the same questions that the reductionist approach did, but instead of taking things apart, the goal is to put them back together and see how they work together. Okay, so that's the analysis versus synthesis point. Okay, now a second thing, and again, here is where I, I'm going to warn you in advance, I have a strong prejudice, but I'm going to try to be as fair as I can. I, I think that the two ways in which people are talking about systems biology come down to taking static versus dynamic views. And I'm very, very focused on the dynamic view, so my description of the static view may be unfair. I'm just saying that at the advance. But the idea with the static view is you're trying to get a snapshot of the system at a particular time, and that snapshot gives you a lot of information. What would be examples of that? Well, let's say you have a histological slide of a piece of tissue. You now actually see not just an individual cells, you see how the whole system is laid out. And various kinds of uh, modern imaging techniques um, working on fixed tissue have taken histology to a, a whole new level. You can now get fluorescence for individual molecules and you can see expressions that are changing and so forth, but you have to see it at one 
uh, one point in time. Similarly, if you get microarray data that gives you very important information about levels of different uh, key molecules in the cell, but it's a snapshot at one time. Another example that we may all experience is that when the doctor takes you in for your annual checkup and gets your blood pressure and your weight and your height and all those are things, the truth is those things fluctuate from moment to moment, from day to day, from month to month, but that gives you a snapshot of how you're doing, and that's useful. And then finally, when people talk about taxonomic relationships, again, that's a very important evolutionary view of how different things may have evolved, but generally they're represented as trees or bushes, and the, the things are relatively static. Now, of course, as new information comes in, they may get adjusted, but the whole idea is that you're trying to come up with, uh, in a certain sense, a relationship that is fixed. Now, a similar example, I think are studies of the genome, proteome, and connectome. So let me briefly define each one of them. The genome, the Human Genome Project, for example, was to find a, a particular uh, human being and find every single uh, nucleotide in the sequence of DNA in that person's entire little set of genes. So it's a whole bunch of ACTG letters over and over again, uh, and that constituted the genome. Now, the point is that when you get that, you have a genome, but it's not dynamic, it's not changing in time, it's the genome. Now, you can use that as a reference to talk about how other genomes vary or are different from it, and that's very important, and you can then start to do classification. But the gene genome itself just sits there, it's just a listing of those, of those letters. Proteome is similar, it's all the proteins that might be expressed at a particular time in a particular setting in a cell or, or in an organ. And the connectome, which is something that's very, uh, people who are studying the nervous system are very excited about, is by using things like um, electron microscopy and other techniques to reconstruct every single possible connection between neurons in a neural network. The problem, of course, again, is it's a static picture. And the way I would summarize this is this view seems to me the systems biology is bioinformatics. And it's very powerful. I mean, if you have, you're looking for an, uh, you've just um, cloned a gene in a system that uh, you're studying and you do a blast search and you can find that there's enough uh, similarity that it's, it might be similar to this other protein that's made and has this other function, then those classificatory um, results are very powerful. And then you can add that to a database and it's very helpful. Um, but bioinformatics is working often with static snapshots. That's my way of thinking about it. It doesn't mean that it can't be dynamic, but that's not what the focus usually is. Now, in contrast, and this is, of course, where I get more excited, there's a dynamic view, which is that biology and many other things, but especially biological uh, organisms and, and groups, are about patterns that change over time. So it could be patterns of movement. It could be patterns of gene expression. It could be patterns of activity in the nervous system. It could be patterns of activity of populations rising and falling. But these are dynamic patterns that change over time. And that was why I put this in my title because that's how I think about systems biology. Now, in order to get a handle on that, that requires that you develop mathematical and computational models. There, simply listing what's there doesn't tell you how A goes to B. You have to have rules for transformation. That could be differential equations. It could be agent-based models, whole variety of different possibilities. But the critical thing is that you are looking at something that changes with time. You're trying to understand these dynamic patterns. That's the focus. Uh, and in general, when you do things like that, your focus is going to be more on what I think of as normal physiology rather than pathology. Now, it doesn't, pathology is very important. Of course, we want to get to translational and medical applications. But understanding the delicate interactions of the different components under ordinary circumstances, I believe, is fundamental to actually get to pathology. And pathology is often a case where the system is being run up against the rails. It's in saturation or it's down at zero, and the rest of it is trying desperately to compensate for that, those, those problems. So you don't learn a lot about what the normal physiology is when you focus so much on pathology. Um, so again, if you're actually looking for dynamic patterns, 
I think it's better to look in the situation when you're looking at normal physiology and learn from that what to do with pathology rather than start with pathology. People who are medically oriented um, will disagree with me. I know that because I've disagreed with them in the past uh, and will, I'm sure, in the future. Um, but I think this is a, an important viewpoint to express and articulate, especially to impressionable young minds who uh, are going out there and maybe encountering that other viewpoint uh, repeatedly. So that creates the notion of systems biology is what I would call biodynamics. You're really interested in how things change over time. Um, so that's all I had to say about what is systems biology. Are there any questions that people have at this point? Okay, that's fine. If things, I mean, I often have the, the brilliant question just after the person has disappeared off my screen and I can no longer talk to them, but you can always send me an email and I, I will respond. Maybe not instantly, but sooner or later. And I will take what you, I will always be interested in what you have to say. Okay, so let me give you some, a little bit of background of, of what gave rise to Bio 300, Dynamics of Biological Systems and the Systems Biology major. So I joined the faculty in 1987 and I regularly collaborated with colleagues in mathematics, computer science, and engineering. And one of the things that was critical for doing an effective collaboration was to share students. And the difficulty was the math students knew math and the biology students knew biology. But there weren't students who had in the same head both knowledge of mathematics and biology. How do you get such students? Well, you can teach them that material and then those students become part of the group that can be focused on these questions, not necessarily just for me, but for anybody else. So it, because I felt it was critical to help students develop the skills so they could be doing experimental and modeling work, in 1999, I proposed a new course, Dynamics of Biological Systems. And in that course, students would learn key concepts from nonlinear dynamical systems theory and would learn to use a programming package, Mathematica, and would reconstruct models from the technical literature. So that's how that course came to be. And those of you who've gone through it, now we realize that that was not something that was magically you know, present from the time that people, I actually said, we need a course like this. I was able to convince my chairman at the time, Norm Rushforth, that we should do it. He was willing to let me try. It took me about a year of preparation to get started. Initially, I had two students. Those of you who've taken it with you know, 36 or 25 or whatever, it started very small and I taught it every semester for the first two or three semesters to try to get people out there and interested in it. And it kept on growing and growing and growing until it got to the size that uh, you're more familiar with. And then from 2000 to 2007, the course was an interactive lecture course with problem sets. So what I would do is I'd end up everyone sitting in front of the computer with Mathematica open. I'd be projecting my computer on the screen and I would type things and have them type. And then it was like blindfold chess because the students would raise their hand when something didn't work. And I'd run around and say, oh, you forgot a bracket. Oh, you missed its parentheses. Oh, that needs a curly brace. Lots of fun. Uh, anyhow, um, and then there were problem sets that we do and the students would go crazy trying to get the problem sets done. Um, and they made some progress. In the second half, I had them reconstruct the models, but I found it was really frustrating they didn't seem to really be able to do very much, even though I'd spent all this time and I'd show them how to do it and I'd have them suggest to me what, they, what I should type next and all this sort of stuff. So in 2008, I made a decision with the help of a very talented graduate student, Kendrick Shaw, to totally redesign the course where I would just talk very briefly at the beginning of class, five minutes, maybe 10 minutes if I was, you know, had lots to say. And then the rest of it, I would just meet with students throughout the class period to discuss results with them and assess, assess their conceptual grasp of the material. So I'd sit down, I'd look at what they did, I would make a few comments, then I, if, uh, I'd do that very quickly just to get a sense of where they were in terms of the problems, and then I'd come back and then we would talk in more detail. And what I found was this had a radical, radical effect on the students' ability to do the material. In the second half of the class, because they, they were the ones who were in charge and they were making the, the stuff work and I was just giving them some suggestions, but they were making it happen. Um, by the second half, when they had to use ND-Solve or other tools um, to, uh, to visualize and to implement the models, like manipulate, they knew how to do it. And so the second half of the semester, instead of being the sort of huge ramp up, was a much more gradual slope. The first part of the course was very hard for the students. 
because mastering Mathematica and uh, understanding concepts of nonlinear dynamical systems theory is not trivial, but I tried to get the on-ramp gen as gently as I could. And then the second half, which is going up to really expert level in one semester, because building a model from scratch is really hard, and even reproducing a model is hard, uh, the students had a much easier time. So that was a very effective change. It's just very labor intensive. And one of the ways I dealt with that was I was able to encourage undergraduates who take the course to serve as my teaching assistants. And so now um, in the classroom, basically during the class session, I'm uh, meeting with the students, the fellow instructors are meeting with students, that's all we're doing. So I, again, I give a brief lecture at the beginning and the rest of it is I'm just talking to the students. And then the students generally, um, when I'm not talking with them, if they are wise students, some of them are, uh, are spending time on the next problems and talking to their teammate and working hard. And they're not uh, on Facebook and, uh, and or checking their email and or seeing what the latest sports results are, latest news. They're actually working and on task. Um, and generally that, that's worked very, very well. Um, so that's the, the course I de developed. And in fact, I took the same design after getting into work in this course where it was more natural. And I shifted what had been a lecture course, Introduction to Neurobiology, to work more or less the same way using simulations of uh, neural components. So those people who have been subjected to Introduction to Neurobiology, they can blame um, Bio 300 for why I teach the course the way I do. Um, and the students don't necessarily love it while they're going through it, but in retrospect, uh, and this is unsolicited testimonials, I don't go out seeking this, I get emails regularly over the years from students who said, you know, that course was incredibly helpful, and now I can do things I never thought I was able to do, and, um, and I really learned much more than I would have if I had a standard, had it presented in a standard way. So that's given me the reinforcement. I mean, some students don't like it. And there's some students, it doesn't matter what I do, there's some students who are so good that I could just show up in class, say, hi, here's the textbook, here's some problems, good luck. And at the end of the semester, I could look at the, over their shoulders and say, yeah, you got an A. But that's a very rare kind of student. For the majority of students, this has really been very helpful to them. Now, um, a course is nice, but it's even better if you have the ability to uh, affect a larger number of people. And that was where the idea of coming up with a whole systems biology major was important. So in 2004, the department made a very good decision and hired uh, Dr. Robin Snyder, who is a theoretical ecologist. And she uses advanced mathematical tools, some of which she creates, her background is in physics, to address fundamental questions in ecology. So working with her and Dr. Joseph Kuntz, who was then the chair of the Department of Biology, we created a systems biology major. And the major has not been huge. It's um, the number of people coming through is usually a fairly small number. But I like to think that on the whole, the quality is very high. And that's what I've, I've been very impressed with. We've managed to <coughs> attract students who have a very wide range of backgrounds. And often these are students who have more interest in math or physics or engineering, but they don't want to be a biomedical engineer and they don't want to be a computer scientist. They really want to be a biologist, but they've got these additional skill sets and most biology courses don't address them. They don't use them at all. There's a lot of memorization, short answer questions and so forth, but having this major allows those students to really flourish and to, um, to reach their full potential. Um, and so this allows them to, us to teach um, the mathematical and computational aspects of systems biology. And part of the major, of course, also encourages students to take courses to give them background in areas such as bioinformatics, databases, computer science, and so on. Um, and uh, I, I just, at this point, and this perhaps is the only thing you'll take away from the entire hour, uh, if you wanna be successful as a systems biologist, you need a strong background in math, computer science and biology. And it doesn't hurt to know physics and it doesn't hurt to know engineering as well, but those are fairly critical math, computer science and biology. Now, I wanna emphasize that since most biology majors, if you start talking about mathematics or even computer programming, run screaming from the room and that's not much of an exaggeration, um, that if you really can combine all of these together and in your head and know them, 
you will have an incredible advantage over many, many others for employment because you have that skill set. And similarly, it is the case that most mathematicians and computer scientists, if you start giving them detailed biological information, they also run screaming from the room. And so again, it's very unusual and difficult to get in the same head all of these different skills. And if you can succeed in that, it is incredibly powerful. So that's why the major is there, and I hope that gives you some sense of the rationale. All right, so now <clears throat> one of the things Smiranda asked me to do was ask, well, you seem to have this systems biology perspective. How does it affect your own research? So the next few minutes, if you choose to doze off because you're not interested, I will understand, and then I'll come back to talk about more interesting things perhaps. But this is the stuff I do on a daily basis. This is what I wake up in the morning and I'm excited to spend time on. So I thought I'd share a little bit of that with you. So um, what the broad question I asked is, uh, and am very interested in, is, is adaptive behavior. Um, this is behavior that allows us to survive and reproduce, and therefore is pretty important from an evolutionary standpoint. Things like being able to walk around the world, um, find um, mates, food, avoid predators. Um, in college, finding food and finding potential mates is a very sort of a major activity, perhaps more important than classes. Um, and indeed, the the, the uh, professors may be seen as the predators who we were trying to avoid. I, I, I don't know, but in any case. The, um, the idea is that this is something that is very critical and this is what evolution works on. Because if you fail to survive, of course you can't reproduce. And if you don't reproduce, you don't leave anything in the population that will have impact later on. So you may have been very successful in your own life, but if you leave no offspring from an evolutionary standpoint, I'm not saying in terms of your moral or ethical worth as a human being, but from an evolutionary standpoint, not leaving offspring means that you're no longer representative of the gene pool. So this is really very important. And that's what evolution selects for. It's this whole package. And um, that system's viewpoint requires that you study the nervous system, not in isolation, but embodied within the context of the body and then situated in a particular environment. And all three of these can be thought of as complex nonlinear dynamical systems in constant interaction with each other. And it's that whole interaction that is selected for by evolution. So this is a rather tall order. It's hard enough to try to imagine studying the nervous system. And now you want to talk about the body and you're also interested in the environment. That's, that's really a lot which is why not everybody is going to be engaged in doing it. But if you could somehow take a slice through this and get at it, it would be very, very interesting. So if you're interested, there's a review I wrote with a colleague, Randy Beer, who uh, is now at the uh, uh, University of Illinois Bloomington. Um, but this, this is a very influential uh, review that we wrote, The Brain Has a Body. It's easy to look up and uh, it's still actually, after all these years, still has lots of relevant points that are worth uh, knowing about. So um, let's see what that involves. Uh, what you want then is a model system which is tractable to analysis at the neural level, at the biomechanical and behavioral level, and at the environmental level. So that means you're probably not gonna be focused on humans if you do that. In fact, even mice and rats are really complicated. Um, maybe you wanna go down to the level of, uh, I don't know, uh, a roundworm like the nematodes, the elegans, it turns out, however, its nervous system is, is somewhat hard to study. So maybe you stop a little bit earlier than that. You do something intermediate, not down to the level of a 600 cell worm, maybe something a little more complex. And that's the reason I've chosen to study this marine mollusca, Plesia californica. Um, and uh, let's see, can you see my, I can't see my own cursor. All right, so the right hand shows the head of the animal, the left hand shows the, the tail of the animal. And the things on the, to the above and below are rocks in case you're having trouble distinguishing what, what's the animal and what's not. Okay, so that's Plesia. Um, and this is uh, its feeding behavior, something it loves to do. You don't have to uh, convince it, it will do it on its own. Uh, and as I will try to show you, um, creating models of its behavior is not that difficult. At least we've shown that we can, can make progress on that. Okay, so previous work had shown that the animal generated three main be feeding behaviors. One is an attempt to grasp food that fails and that's called biting, which is confusing because when we bite something, we actually bring it into our mouths. But the uh, person who studied this, Irv Kupferman, called the attempt to, to, to food feed um, biting. So that's what we're stuck with. 
Swallowing is when you actually pull food in and rejection is when if the animal encounters something that's not edible, it pushes out. I should mention that this animal is also capable of learning uh, that certain foods are edible and some are inedible. So it's complex enough to do some of the things that we take for granted, um, but uh, it's uh, tractable enough to analysis that we can understand how it's doing it. And that's what we'll be focusing on. So the question that I've been focused on are what are the neural mechanical mechanisms underlying this multifunctional adaptive behavior? And so we address this question both experimentally and by creating a series of increasingly complex and realistic models of the feeding apparatus. So usually at this point, I just jump to the latest model and I talk about what we've learned. Instead, what I'm gonna do for you is show you the iterative process that we went through to actually understand more about this system. So um, here's an example of the biting behavior. Okay, you see that there's this thing that comes out. Let me see if I can... Uh, play that again. There's this horseshoe shaped structure that came out and went back in. So this is an example of a bite where the animal is attempting to get food and is not succeeding. And the question that we were confronted with before even talking about multifunctionality was, you know, just how does it work? How does the animal do that? So what we wanted to do was to focus first on the body and understand the mechanics of the behavior. Now you have to understand how unusual that is. Most people would immediately get to the nervous system, throw the body away and start looking at the neural circuitry. And that's what the majority of people who study this have done. But we were the uh, rather weird group that instead said, no, the, the, the behavior is how the body and the behavior, how you interact with the environment. So we really need to understand the biomechanics, the mechanical properties, the musculature and so on. Now, a little background is necessary because probably not all of you think about mechanical models on a daily basis. I mean, maybe some of you do, but it's certainly not something I knew about until I came to case and started to interact with people in mechanical and biomedical engineering like Pat Craigo and Joe Mansour. So some models are basically what are called kinematic models, and there the movements are constrained by geometry. So if you had a limb, and what you wanted to do is a kinematic model, you would have a pin joint and you would ask if I have a, line, a length here and a length here and I have a joint here, write down the equations, would be involve some sines and cosines, for how this a part of the limb would move relative to that point. Now, the problem with the kinematic model is it doesn't have any forces. So your model could easily have this part of the, of the arm go right through this part of the, of the, of the uh, of the arm, that this upper part of the arm go through the lower part of the arm because there are no constraints in terms of forces unless you impose them. But you can get a sense of the geometry, how things move, and that's very important. Now, the alternative, uh, and often people build on this, are kinetic models. And these are models where you actually have a force generating muscle and you would have a joint and then you would activate the muscle. And because of the mechanics of the joint and its relationship to the forces, you would get a torque, which would then move the, the, uh, the other part of the limb and you would actually see movement. So you get kinematics out of a kinetic model, but the kinetic model actually represents the underlying forces. And it usually has an equation of motion, again, based on Newton's laws, describing how those forces are applied, where they're applied and so on. So this is where, this is what mechanical engineers do to understand things. And both statics uh, or kinematics and kinetics are very important. If you're building a bridge, you obviously want it to be statically stable, but if the wind comes and starts swaying the cables back and forth, you also have to make sure that the forces that are generated are ones that the bridge can withstand. And when you have traffic pounding on it and the bridge uh, the, uh, the bed of the bridge starts moving up and down, either in the wind or in the traffic. You don't want to have what's happened uh, in rare cases. I don't know if every, any of you have seen their movies. You can look it up called Galloping Gertie. There was a, a bridge where they hadn't done this properly, and it started to resonate at frequencies that actually destroyed the entire bridge. It fell apart. So you really have to know both. Um, but these are the kinds of things that engineers spend a lot of time worrying about. The other thing that you can deal with is the animal is soft, it's soft bodied. And you could, for that, to get the soft body, use a finite element or a continuum model. But the way most models are made is you start with solid bodies and that's much easier to deal with. There's a much less computation. So we decided after thinking about it that our first model should be purely kinematic and it should use solid bodies. And this is essentially the simplest possible model. So this is our first model, the feeding apparatus right here. So I'll let it run and then I'll talk about it. 
Now, <coughs> there's a muscle back here, which is represented by the line. And what your mind tells you is the following, I'll just run it now. As this contracts, it pushes this forward. Then it's going through these rings, which are kind of like donuts. And then after it relaxes, the donuts start to squeeze and they push it all the way back. And then it relaxes back to its original position. The, seeing this motion allows you to kind of intuit what the different muscle forces must be. But that's not actually how this model is working at all. This model is taking this ball, moving it backwards and forwards and forcing the geometry to stay constrained. So as I move it backwards, each of these rings has to stay in touch with the previous one. And if it gets shorter, because its volume is constant, it gets fatter, okay? And then I'm just drawing on top of this, the rotation of the surface that you saw coming out to grab it. So I'm only moving the ball back and forth. It's a pure kinematic model, but our minds are able to look at something like this and intuit what the forces might well be. So this is very interesting, it was very exciting. And it made predictions about what we should see in terms of the shape. Let me just go back for a second. Let's see. Here, it should look like a ball. And then when it's at the peak of going backwards, retraction, it should be very thin and skinny. So that was a prediction that this model made. So were the predictions correct? Now it turns out that when these slugs are really tiny, like 10 millimeters in length, they're almost transparent, but you can transilluminate them. And this is what you see when you do that. Um, so you're watching the side and top view of this animal uh, chugging away on a little piece of seaweed over here. So this tiny, this is a, you know, a, a, a hugely magnified because this thing is, is about this size. Um, and the, uh, the thing I'll draw your attention to is this. When this gets to the peak, Let's see, you're, you're looking at the shadow it's casting. So here it is at the peak and look, that looks like a ball. So that's peak protraction and it really does look like a ball. But then let's look at what happens to the retraction. Oh, let's see, back. You see how there's this thing sticking out the back? So the model did not predict that change in shape at all. So what we can say is the following, that the model was very successful for peak protraction and it essentially failed for retraction. Now, ordinarily, when you get a failing grade on something, you do not rejoice and jump around and say, that's a wonderful thing. But when a model fails, if you know how to do modeling, you say, oh, that means we really don't understand something and that's where we don't understand it. Before, we didn't even know what we didn't understand. So we're way ahead of the game because now we understand something and now we know better about what we don't understand. That's really very valuable. So that meant we should visualize the internal movements better. And so we developed an MRI interface that allowed us to see the inner movements of the feeding apparatus during behavior. This is work of David Neustadter for his PhD thesis. And this is the inside of a slug as it's biting using MRI. Here's the lumen of the gut, here's the esophagus, here's, here's that grasper that you saw from the outside, here's the jaws, and here the grasper is, whoops, let me see if I can grab, it, grab this and do it more slowly. Okay, here the grasper comes forward, all the way, now there you see the ball shape, and then it goes back, and you see how it changes shape, and that gives you much more of that protrusion that we saw. And in swallowing, when there's a load here, that protrusion gets even bigger. That's because the halves of the grasper are, are closing, and the shape of the entire thing changes and protrudes out. So this led us to develop a much more detailed three-dimensional kinematic model, which I'll show you now. So this is reconstructing what you just saw as a series of meshes. And again, just very briefly, what we're seeing here again, so the back muscle I talked about is not even shown here for clarity, but you can imagine that it's, it's pushing this whole thing forward. And these in, in front, you can imagine push it back. And here, this internal structure that you can see the sort of reddish thing is actually the base of the grasper. And when the grasper is closing, it comes out. And when it's open, it's within it. So we can tell when it's open and when it's closed and we can use that to give us information that's incredibly valuable because this model tells us, it usefully predicts um, which muscles are activated at different times to generate like swallowing behavior. 
but they also this also provide us understanding of how the muscles are activated differently during those different behaviors, biting, swallowing, rejection. So I'm not going to take the time. You could hear me speak about this. If you type in Cheel Lab in um, YouTube, there is actually a series of videos that I put together where I go through in excruciating detail how biting, swallowing, rejection work both mechanically and neurally and give you all the references if you're interested in that. I'm not going to take the time here. I wanted to show you an iteration of models that led to deeper insight. And then <coughs> what I've left out, of course, is the neural part. But we do the same cycle. Instead of putting in super detailed, very, very elaborate neural models, we started off with much, much, much more nominal neuromechanical models. So the neuron pools are represented by these three uh, brightly colored uh, circles there, A0, A1, and A2. And you can see a very simplified representation of the, um, the feeding apparatus, which can open, close, or move forward and back. Okay, so we have simplified mechanics, and then there are these three pools, one for protracting, moving forward, open, uh, being closed as you protract, and then retracting, closed. And <coughs> we set up inhibitory interactions between the neural pools using basically lotka volterra dynamics, and this created something called the stable heteroclinic channel. Now, those of you who've taken Vial 300, look at Lotka Volterra instead of freaking out. They say, oh, yeah, predator prey. I've seen that kind of stuff before. And so this is super simple. Now, stable heteroclinic channels, again, for those of you who don't understand what I say in the next few sentences, don't worry. Just take Vial 300 and it'll be clear. So a saddle equilibrium point is one in which in one direction you are stable and you're pulled in, and another direction you're unstable and you go away. Now, if you take three saddles and you take the unstable part of one and let it go to the stable part of the second, and then take the unstable of the second and let it go to the stable of the third, and take the unstable of the third and let it go to the stable of the first, follow that, I create a triangle. And that actually will oscillate. Now, the problem is, since these are each equilibrium points, if you get pressed onto them, you'll stay there forever. So if you add a little noise, you will dwell as long as you need to, where you need to, and then move to the next and the next. So this is unlike a limit cycle where you can't stay anywhere. You have to keep moving around the cycle. A stable heteroclinic channel allows you to dwell for arbitrarily long times at different configurations. Now, if none of that made any sense, take Bio 300 and it'll make much more sense, okay? But again, you can ask me more questions later. Okay, um, so analysis of this model allowed us to predict how animals to change their behavior in response to changes in mechanical load. This is a projection. It's a six-dimensional model, and you're looking at two three-dimensional projections. On the left-hand side, those three motor pools, A0, A1, and A2, are projected down. Turns out that they live in three dimensions, but they take up only about a triangular space, so you can just press them down onto a plane, and you haven't lost anything. And the solid line shows what happens when you increase the load on the system by increasing the force on the seaweed by 40%, which is a substantial increase in the force that the system has to deal with. Now on the right, you're looking at a projection of the ratio of activations of the protractor and retractor muscle, that's along the x-axis, and then the actual position of the grasper. And what you can see from the um, change from the solid to the dotted is as you go from a force of the seaweed of 0.05 to 0.07, which is a 40% increase, you see the dash, dashing line shows that the shape of the trajectory changes. Okay, all right, so the animal is now handling, we're trying to ask, what does the animal do when it handles a tougher piece of seaweed? So you increase the load by 40%. If you look at these projections, you'll see that the projections in terms of the neural stuff don't change. They're superimposed. It's all changing out somehow in the mechanics. And what's happening is the retraction phase, the phase of pulling in is prolonged. And because it takes longer with cause the opposing force to reach your fully retracted position. The beauty of that is that these are slow muscles and the longer it takes to do something, the more force the muscles can generate. So that more force draws more seaweed in during that cycle. So you pull for longer and you do a little bit stronger. And the end result is that you only lo lose amount of fitness, that is the amount of seaweed ingested per time, of about 1% for a 40% change. So here's a deep question. How is it that uh, animals are so robust 
and able to maintain fitness in the response to perturbations. And this very simplified six-dimensional neuromechanical model starts to answer that question. Okay, so this was published uh, a few years ago. Um, now, the last thing I'll say in terms of this modeling stuff for my things, then we'll go on to more general stuff, is that this didn't talk about the question of multifunctionality, biting, swallowing, injection. That's one of the most interesting aspects of this system. If you have a, I don't know how many of you have had a Swiss army knife. Um, if you look at the ads, they show them splayed out like this. Could you use the knife that way? No. The, the scissors are gonna interfere with the forceps and the, the bobby pin and the awl and the corkscrew. You have to put everything away except for one thing. That's the tool you use. And then you put it away and you take out another tool. Now think of your hands. You can go from uh, picking up a pen to pounding on a table, to unscrewing a jar, to playing the piano seamlessly. You're not Inspector Gadget. You don't have to keep on pulling out a new device. You have all of this in your hands by deploying the different degrees of freedom within them. So the question of multifunctionality is a very broad one. And to get that, that we needed a more complex neuromechanical model. And this was done very recently with Vicki Webster Wood, who's now at Carnegie Mellon. And what you have is at the bottom, you see a, an image of the buccal mass. Above that, you see some of the key motor neurons. The level above that, you see some local interneurons. And above that, you have higher order interneurons that are actually in another ganglion that's more encephalized. So that's a far more complicated model than the three motor pools I showed you in the previous one. But what allowed the plus is that you can now identify components of the model with components of the nervous system. Oh, and I should emphasize, what makes the system so amazing is you can actually identify cells in animal after animal and give them names. So B3 is a motor neuron that shows up in a certain location and it innervates certain muscles and it has certain properties in terms of when it's active. So you can really draw these circuits in detail. That's what's attracted me to Plisia and others. And what do we find? Um, so to keep it simple, we made the um, uh, neuron models very simple, just on off switches. Um, and we have the biomechanics is also simplified, but we show that with appropriate sensory inputs, the model can generate movements corresponding to three behaviors, biting, swallowing, or ejection, and it can handle increasing mechanical loads with no change in the circuitry or the mechanics. It can just, just that's part of the dynamics that's set up. And the beauty is this is a modular model. So part of the ongoing research we're doing is to replace the biomechanical, very nominal biomechanical model with more realistic models and the very nominal neural models with more realistic neural models. And this is ongoing. And again, someone who's interested in this kind of research can approach me and potentially get involved in doing this if they like. You don't have to love slugs to enjoy working in my laboratory, though it helps. Okay, and anyhow, this is again part of that paper that was recently published last year. All right, um, let me draw some general um, lessons from what I've just shown you. Uh, and if you didn't follow all the details, don't worry about it. We call the approach that I've been talking about is the demand-driven complexity approach to modeling. That was actually an idea that was formulated first by Randy, but I've just illustrated for you concretely. The first point is that modeling is an iterative process. The goal is not a perfect model, but a model that makes predictions that can be tested experimentally. The second point, and I emphasize this at the correct at the appropriate time, model failures. Failures are opportunities to better understand the system to focus on the next most important of aspect of the system that needs to be understood. That's why failures are so important. If you create a model that is so vague that anything goes, then it hasn't given you any information. And if you create a model that's so perfect that nothing fails, okay, maybe you're done but maybe you haven't perturbed the system quite right to see where the model fails. Because if the model is as complicated as the original system, you might as well just study the original system and throw away the model. Models are supposed to be somewhat simplified and that means they're gonna have inaccuracies. But the goal is to make those inaccuracies smaller and smaller over time. So you test the model with data, you incorporate the next most important aspect of the biological system and you repeat. And that's the key idea. A lot of people don't get that when they think of modeling, they think of, I'm gonna get all this data, it's too early to start modeling. And once I have all the data, I'll throw it into this incomprehensive model and I'll predict exactly what I need to know. And that almost never works. 
So the general rule is you want to always develop the simplest model that captures the essential features of the system and add complexity only if required by res experimental results. Now, I want to emphasize that there is another aspect to modeling that I'm not focusing on here because here I'm really focused primarily on the modeling experiment cycle. But there is another important aspect. Models allow you to explore the space of possibilities and having an understanding of that space is, is vital. Um, in some cases, people are so focused on creating super detailed realistic models, they miss the value and the power of a much more abstract mathematical model to give you a sense of the space of possibilities. But, and this is where modelers have to always be patient with biologists. Data constrains models to how the biological system actually works. And if you don't pay attention to those constraints, your models can be way off and no biologist who is self-respecting is going to take seriously a model that says, oh, I've proven, I have a theorem that proves that this is true, go and show this in the laboratory. Now, if the uh, biologist looks at the model and it's left out everything that's important about the biological system, and they know that it takes 10 to 15 years to do the, the relevant experiments, it is not surprising that they are going to walk, walk away from the modeler and not play, pay any attention to what the modeler has to say. The key point I'm also making, and this is where a systems biology major can be unusual. If you know both languages, you can be a go-between, you can be a translator, you can be a bridge. You can go up to the person who's doing experiments and say, have you ever thought of looking at this? And you know enough about the experimental work to actually not say something vague in general, but a specific thing. You can go back to the modeler and say, you know, it seems to me that we've left out this aspect from my reading and from what the biologist is telling me. And this is something modelers don't often get. Biologists actually know an enormous amount about their system. It's just qualitative and it's expressed in biology jargon. So if you can get past the jargon and understand their feeling for the organism, the qualitative stuff, that's hugely powerful, unbelievably powerful. Ignoring that is stupid. But if you can understand that and think of how to translate that, suddenly you can do things that nobody else has been able to do for making sense out of the system. So you have the superpower that other people don't if you master both aspects. Okay, now I'm gonna just briefly talk about some of the things that I think are super cool out there right now that any one of you could potentially contribute to and, and then I'll wrap up. So five more minutes, I think I'll be done. So you may have heard of this. This is the protein folding problem. Proteins are composed of sequences of linked amino acids. At each linkage between amino acids, the peptide bond, there are two torsional angles. The, they're usually referred to as phi and psi that need to be set to determine the structure of the protein. The peptide bond itself is rigid. That's the omega angle. But the phi and psi, they can rotate. Now, assume that there are no more than two choices for each of these angles, which is a great gross oversimplification. They actually have multiple choices, but let's start with just two. So that's four possible configurations. It could be like this or that on this side or this or that on that side, four possibilities. Now, if there are n amino acids, four choices at each peptide bond, that's four to the n minus one possible configurations. And lysozyme, which consists of only 100 amino acids, the number of possible configurations for those torsional angles based on this argument is four to 100 minus one, four to 99, or about, uh, I can't see that number because my thing is covering it, but I think it's four times 10 to the 59th possibilities. It's a huge, huge number, okay? That's massive, but proteins this long and much longer fold in hundreds of milliseconds. They don't seem to be confused by all their possibilities. Somehow they find the right place. How do they do it? That's the protein folding problem. Okay, for those of you who know enough computer science, this is an MP hard problem as formulated here. Okay, it's non-polynomial time, it's clearly exponential, but it's being done in polynomial time. Wow. Solve that, you've got a lot of, you'll be very famous, okay? Now, right now, uh, machine learning approaches are used to take a lot of other proteins that have been folded and they understand their X-ray structure and they've re reconstructed them and use those as exemplars to say, okay, if I see this sequence, there are a few changes, there are a few mutations here and there, but basically it's gonna fold like this. And the predictions are pretty good, but it doesn't say anything about the underlying, how does it actually work? So that's an open problem and it's still an open problem. Another example, 
local plasticity and global behavior. The human brain contains billions of neurons and there are trillions of connections between them. This is no exaggeration, it's amazing. Now, unlike artificial neural networks, neurons form connections even before birth, while you're you know, a fetus in, in, the, in the uterus, and that's all due to spontaneous activity. The expectant mom gets all this kicking um, because those are spontaneous motions that the embryo is generating. And again, if you watch in the ultrasound, sometimes you'll see the, uh, the fetus is turning handsprings. All this is going on before birth. Now, after birth, within a relatively short time, nervous systems in humans are capable of complex pattern recognition. Oh, that's mommy. Oh, that's daddy. Oh, that's my friend. Oh, that's a doggy. Oh, that's a, a table. That's a chair. Uh, a few years after, language. And then a few years beyond that, higher cognitive function. So somehow you're taking these billions of neurons and trillions of connections and you are setting them up in such a way that you can do all these things. And we take it for granted, but it's actually astonishing. And again, in terms of the computational complexity problem, again, very, very hard problem. And the amount of data that's needed to train a biological nervous system is far smaller than what is needed for current artificial neural networks. And the system easily incorporates new information, and makes projections about the future, none of which our current artificial neural networks do well or at all, depending on how they're designed. And the number of training trials generally is huge. And then generalization and taking them, sometimes you have to just start from scratch and retrain them because if you try to add new stuff, they lose other things. Now, we know that neurons form local connections based on patterns of activity. And the big question is how does local plasticity, changes in uh, connections between neurons give rise to coherent global behavior? Once again, that's a Nobel prize, easy for you to grasp and take home uh, another visit to Stockholm for you. After you've taken care of the protein folding problem, this is the, the next thing you can solve. All right, and then the last thing I'll talk about very briefly is development, which I think is also an incredible frontier. So there's a movie that you can look up and shows the development of C. elegans. This is the, uh, the single cell that's been fertilized has, has split in two. And if you watch the movie, I don't, we don't have time, you'll see it becomes about 600 cells. And as you're watching, you'll see there's a cleavage plane and then it starts moving around inside the egg and then it just swims away, okay? Within a matter of a few hours. So you have a fertilized egg that divides repeatedly. Each cell contains a complete description of the organism. They each have DNA, but depending on the cell's lineage and environment, only part of that self description is accessible. And cells have receptors for chemicals released by other cells and can release chemicals themselves and can follow chemical gradients. Some cells are programmed to die as part of the developmental process. I've just given you all the information for how cells can translocate. Cells can actually form assemblages. Some can die away. And that, for example, if you start with webs, you end up with fingers. Um, and so you have morphology. And once in final position, a cell may assume a final identity, such as a nerve cell. And you have an exponentially increasing set of cells in polynomial time. So notice there's a theme here of dealing with huge numbers of possibilities and narrowing them, them down very quickly to what's, what's relevant and what's useful. And the process varies, so even identical twins can differ at the cellular level. So I've talked about protein folding, um, local plasticity and global behavior and development. Briefly, um, intracellular networks, cardiovascular and respiratory physiology, helping to steer, control the immune network, ecological networks and response to perturbation. And finally, evolution and climate change. These are open areas. Any person who has a systems biology background who chooses could spend an entire career studying these very exciting and important questions. So um, I'll let me just summarize and then I'm done and I can take any questions you may have. So I've explained the idea of systems biology as bioinformatics. I think of that as a much more static way of thinking about um, and of categorizing and looking at static snapshots, but it's very powerful and very valuable. What it gets me much more excited is systems biology is biodynamics. And there you have to actually be comfortable creating um, dynamic models, uh, couple differential equation models, agent-based models, models that change and develop patterns over time, just like biology does. I've emphasized, and I can't emphasize this enough, math, computer science, have to be mastered along with biology. That's critical to becoming a successful systems biologist. 
Uh, it's hard enough to master biology, so this is a tall order, but if you can do it, as I said, it makes you really unique, very special, and gives you a powerful access to jobs that either math and computer science students or biology students alone can't get. I've given you an example in some detail of how you iteratively model a neuromechanical system. And I drew the lesson that the methodology for this is demand-driven complexity models are not, you're not going for a perfect model. You're going for a good enough model that gives you a lot of insight, tells you where you don't understand, helps you iterate by directing the experimental work and then the experimental work is reincorporated into the next version of the model and the process repeats. And finally, I've shown you that there are multiple exciting frontiers in systems biology at all levels of the biology, and I commend the future to you. It is in your hands. With that, I, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, if I can. Somehow my, oops, are, are, you, are you all? Yeah, there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. That was a wonderful talk. Very interesting. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm open for questions and I, I don't have to rush away, so. I guess I can go. Um, thank you again for your time. Um, uh, my question is more to do with um, like the systems biology major and classes and things like that. Um, so if people have more like science-y questions, they can also jump in first if they want. Sure, sure. I, I guess, um, I, I'm really glad that I listened to this talk because it's made a lot more sense like the path that we go through uh, in order to complete the major um, with all of the goals you had in mind. But I guess like the final thing that I was wondering was, um, I think a lot of us have very different like plans for like post-graduation and things like that. But when you were conceptualizing the major, what was um, your goal like professionally for one of us to be able to do immediately upon graduation? That's a very good question, Jillian. My, my goal was to have you have as many options as possible, which is a strange answer, but it's the right answer. In other words, if you're pre-med, I wanted you to have this unusual situation where someone is showing you a lot of data, and instead of saying, oh, there's a lot of data here, you're thinking, I wonder if there's a paper that has a technical model, and then you go off and you actually build something yourself. And then you come back and say, you know, I think we might have more luck, luck with some of these uh, anesthetization procedures, if we did it this way, and they'll look at you like you're crazy and say, well, the model shows. And again, they may shut down at that point. But if you've done it carefully and you, you know the literature, you can actually point out that this particular way of doing treatment allows for lighter anesthesia and better recovery um, and, and many fewer uh, side effects because the data suggests that, but it's hard to see it until you put it together in a model. If you decided to work for a pharmaceutical industry and they wanted you to figure out the best uh, antiviral, probably COVID right now, but anti, uh, the, you know, they, they're interested in antiviral, antibacterial agent, and they wanted you to be able to figure out what the appropriate epitopes were, the things that the antigens would see and would bind to and create antibodies, then you would know how to manipulate models that would allow you to actually look at the docking sites and, and represent that. If you ended up working for the Great Lakes Commission and they were asking what level of fishing is sustainable, you might say, oh, I had a problem like that in Bio 300 and pull out your old dynamics of biological systems um, notebooks and say, oh, that's so simplified. Wow, that's a harvesting model. But you at least understand that there are ways in which if you over harvest, the whole system can go extinct and you can read the more advanced literature and then come back with a, a quantitatively based answer. So I'm talking about government, I'm talking about business, I'm talking about industry, I'm talking about medicine, engineering, computer science, the whole gamut of things, because biology is increasingly the sort of the, the technology that everybody is beginning to realize that if they could actually master it, we could do amazing things. And if you're a systems biologist, because you have the more quantitative background, you don't sort of just know about it qualitatively, you can actually build something, you can make something that will make predictions. So that was my goal, and which is very different than saying, I want you to be able to get into the medical school of your choice or be good for you know, working for big pharma. It was giving you the tools so that you could do almost anything, uh, which I think is going to be very useful in the coming years. So I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely does. <laughs> Other questions?
Um, I had one <clears throat> kind of a smaller point that you brought up in your presentation. So when you were building Bio 300, I guess like <laughs> before I took it, you know, I had never heard of Mathematica. So it's like, what what made you land on Mathematica for the language that we were taught? That's a very good question. So I, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, <coughs> first lecture. There are lots of choices. I could have had you do a programming course and done everything in C++ or Java. Um, but the problem is a lot of that would create this barrier. A lot of biology students don't have any kind of strong background in computer uh, science and in programming. And I didn't want to spend hours and hours and days and days and weeks graphical user interfaces and file systems and where do I store data and all this kind of stuff. If you're doing C, that's not hidden from you. I mean, you have to link to the appropriate libraries and you have to compile them in and so forth. And that, you know, there are higher order things you can do in C and there's lots that's been built, but it doesn't free you of having to deal with a lot of stuff that you don't really want students to have to worry about. If you use a specialized thing like neuron or amber, neuron is for modeling nervous systems, amber is for molecular dynamics, then it's really great for that, but it's terrible for other things. It's just too specialized. Now, among those things that are general purpose, you have Mathematica, you have Maple, you have MATLAB. I don't know why they all start with M, but they do. Um, and any one of those, in a certain sense, uh, is close to being equivalent. Oh, one that starts with P is Python. That would have been another one I could have considered. Now, if Python had been better developed and had more of the kinds of tools it does now, like the Jupyter Notebooks, I probably would have done it in that. Um, and I have thought about uh, possibly switching over. But having worked with Python and with Jupyter Notebooks, there's still a lot of cruft that students are exposed to and have to deal with that for someone who doesn't have the kind of background um, that makes that easy, would make it very, very off-putting. And they get you know, a few of the error messages and they, they, they simply shut down. In Mathematica, <coughs> the built-in functions and some of the simple things that are easy to invoke allow you to do very, very powerful things with very few lines. And you get immediate feedback. So, and the other thing that for me sold me on Mathematica was two, two really very powerful things. One is that you can do word processing. So I could write my entire textbook in Mathematica, and then I could hand it to you. And so you could just take code from the textbook. Think about other textbooks you've had, right? Even if they provide you MATLAB code, unless they put it in some other form, you have to type that in again. Now they might hand you files, but here you could go to one of my figures, pick up the code, put it in your own notebook, activate it, get the same figure, and then start tweaking it. So the overhead to actually presenting very complicated, um, uh, very complicated stuff was much lower, and you could read and go back to the text and see how that integrated. The second thing that was really powerful was manipulate, because there you could take um, a, a, a model and then you could dynamically alter it by moving uh, sliders or clicking buttons and see the model change right in front of you, instantly. So suddenly, and for me, this is the most important thing. Biologists are actually, this is something that math, math, mathematicians, computer science and engineers often forget. Biologists are very smart people, but they think differently. They are focused on seeing examples. They like actually watching dynamic processes. That's what they do. They'll spend hours staring through a microscope at a paramecium because it's just so cool. And during that time, they'll learn a lot about how it works and have some, all, all these interesting ideas. Um, with Manipulate, you can turn math into an experimental science. You can play with the model. You can then change and then people in the second half of the semester, of course, the models get too complicated, you can't do it. But if you had a three-dimensional, four-dimensional model and 10 parameters, you could actually set up and manipulate and learn a huge amount about you know, equilibrium points and instability and oscillations and all sorts of stuff just by playing. That's very hard to do in almost anything else that I know of, including MATLAB. Not impossible, but just much harder. So those are the things that... Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, I have no clue to do it in MATLAB as we stand. And Here that's what, right. And so the ability to put together text 
uh, dynamic equations that the students could simply pick up and use and to be able to manipulate models. For me, that was the selling point for Mathematica. And it's, again, even though it's not as popular as some of the other things, once you get the principles, the nice thing about Mathematica, uh, the, the, the principles are everything's an expression and all you're doing is transforming one expression into another, which is a very mathematical way of thinking about it, very abstract. But once you get it, you can do an incredible amount with that. They're, they're, the, the new things they're learning are the particular specific functions, some of the details, but the principles of what you're doing are the same over and over again. So it's much easier than other programming languages where you have to keep on um, mastering different kinds of things. That, that was why I went for mathematics. Yeah, I was just, because um, when I took the class, like I, I had used MATLAB before, and then right after the class, I proceeded to use MATLAB to do like dynamic modeling from then until now. So, right. and I knew, I was trying to think it was like, there was a reason that Mathematic was chosen over MATLAB. I just couldn't think of what it was, but right. yeah. Okay, those are the reasons. And again, it was easier for you to use MATLAB having done Mathematica. Oh, 100%. <laughs> I mean, ODE 45 is not really the most, I mean, once you get used to it, it's not bad, but it's really not the most transparent. And again, everything in MATLAB is focused on matrix manipulations. That's really what it's about. Right. But in, in Mathematica, that's lists, and the list transformations are very straightforward. So again, once you think about how to translate from Mathematica and MATLAB, most of the things that are going on conceptually are not very difficult. Just It's just learning the syntax and, and, and things like that. So anyhow. Uh, I, I like a tool that starts off and can be presented in very simple ways, but is actually every bit as sophisticated and complicated as any of the very advanced tools. So, all right, other questions? Uh, could you speak more about like the engineering and creation uh, aspect of systems biology? Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about it. This is a whole area that's uh, going to be more and more exciting. So there's a whole area that's now called synthetic biology. Have you heard of it? Um, the basic idea is <laughs> that you would use your understanding of how biological systems work to actually create, for example, a complete artificial cell. Now that was just fantasy and science fiction. That's no longer so much fantasy and science fiction. With CRISPR-Cas9, the ability to now go in and reach into um, an adult and change parts of the genome is incredibly powerful. But of course, one of the things you'd like to do before you muck around too much with that, since those, none of those tools are perfect and they may actually change other things, you might wanna spend some time modeling what might happen if you do this. Similarly, if you're an epidemiologist and you're confronted with a pandemic and there's yet another new variant, um, if you have a set of models and tools and that you can say things about what will happen if we do X versus if we do Y to the spread and speed. I mean, not everybody's gonna pay attention and do what the, what the best advice is, but you can set up these very good models to talk about how to flatten the curve so you don't overwhelm the health system, what social distancing can do for you, uh, how to avoid super spreader events. All of these kinds of concepts are things you can build and then manipulate and use to predict aspects of the future. So the engineering aspect, the other engineering aspect, of course, is that if you come up with a better understanding of any of the things I talked about, protein folding, if you're really interested in the process, well, then you could design your own proteins. Right now, people are doing that, it's hit and miss. And it sort of works because again, you use what you've seen before, you put motifs together, but it's still somewhat hit and miss. If you could actually simulate what the protein's gonna do when you put it in a particular sequence and describe that protein in detail, that would be very powerful. If you understood uh, how learning actually works, then you could create far more powerful artificial neural networks than what we currently have. And if you were able to actually, instead of having to manufacture devices, you could develop them. That would be amazing, astonishing, the kinds of things that could be created under those circumstances. So anytime you have deeper understanding at the systems level of what is actually going on, your possibility of engineering things, either using biological materials or even other materials, silicon, uh, and, and creating new, new, new devices 
is hugely in, in, in enhanced. I didn't talk about this, but I have for many years been collaborating with uh, Roger Quinn in mechanical engineering and more recently Katie Del Torrio. And we've been focused on biologically inspired robotics. And these are uh, robots that incorporate various kinds of biologically inspired components. So one of the things we did some decades, actually now back in like 1994, we showed that if you had a six-legged robot and you incorporated reflexes, it could handle incredibly irregular terrain with very little difficulty. Um, so that's where you take the ideas from biology, you apply them in an engineering context, and suddenly you can do things that engineered devices previously could not do. So it's a very, very powerful area. And the more you know systems biology, the more comfortable you are collaborating with engineers and being able to speak their language so they can take what you know and turn it into an engineering device or yourself become uh, a synthetic or a biologist or bioengineer. Any other questions? Yeah, I actually have one too, back uh, a little bit more general. Um, We've sure. talked a lot about like uh, all the problems that are potentially solved um, with people who know systems biology and all that. And I was just wondering your like what your opinion is on why the major is still kind of small after so many years. Like I, I was thinking that at this point, technology, like we know that technology goes hand in hand with any science and everyone's using it. So why wouldn't more people be, you know, interested in doing this? So there, that's a wonderful question. And I've thought about this as well. Um, here's the issue. First of all, <coughs> there's the publicity issue. So you're the best ambassadors. And if you tell your friends, this is the most wonderful major and they've got to think about it when they're about to declare a major, you could see a doubling or tripling of systems biology majors. But the answer is, and this is what I sort of hinted at earlier, and this is why the courses I teach are uh, a rather rocky adjustment for most of the students in those courses. Uh, I'm trying to put together disciplines that have traditionally been very far apart. And people are really good at biology. And they know that from high school, they're fascinated by the different structures. They have no problems memorizing all these different complicated names. They probably wanna be a doctor or they'd like to study some aspect of how biology works. And they often are very repelled by math and computer science because it seems to them to be a um, conspiracy to convince them that they're idiots. And the people who know how to do it well are very impatient with them and don't sort of seem to be able to communicate in a way that makes sense to them. And vice versa, people who are math or computer science people are very good at thinking in their heads, seeing abstract patterns and being able to get the intuitions in that abstract way and then figure out how you potentially could show through a proof that that will be true for all cases. And that's very, very difficult to do all cases, not just exceptions to the rule. And they get very impatient with biology because it's all exceptions and it's all arbitrary. Why is leucine called leucine? And why is isoleucine called isoleucine? Why is the pituitary called the pituitary? I don't know, they thought it was a mucus secreting gland. I mean, it's all ridiculous and you have to memorize all this crap to be able to talk about biology. So what happens is that <laughs> you're talking about the intersection of two uh, sets. And if you think about the Venn diagram, that intersection is not close to being the set of all uh, elements in both sets. It's a very, very much smaller intersection. So that's another way of saying it's pretty hard to do systems biology, but it's very worthwhile. Um, but again, you are the best ambassadors. If you see this as something that's valuable and worthwhile, you should be telling people, this is really the most exciting thing you could do with your life. And if you're interested, and you can emphasize the point I made to Jillian, you're not locking yourself into anything by being a systems biology major. You can go to medical school. You can become an engineer. You can become a business person and get an MBA. None of that is precluded by being a systems biologist. And you got a BS, which is a professional degree. So you can go into government. If you go out and tell people that, again, a lot of people find that the major is hard. They ask, what are you taking? Well, I'm taking the more advanced physics. I'm taking the more advanced math. I'm taking computer science. I'm taking databases. They say, no, this is not for me. I'm sorry, forget it, right? So I think that's what's happening, that people look at all that and they say, this is just too much, too much coursework of stuff I'm not gonna be able to make sense out of 
I, I want to be able to live and breathe as an undergraduate. So this is not for me. But if on the other hand, you have this larger view, which I try to present why it's important to master these things, how valuable it can be, then uh, I think that's useful. One of the things that I like very much about teaching Bio 300, and this happens almost every semester, a student approaches me and says, you know, it's during ad drops, you know, I, I'm doing the exercises. I, I really don't know if I can do this. So I talk to the student and I get a sense of their background and I get a sense of who the student is and their level of, you know, dedication, their motivation. And if I see that they're really smart and super motivated, I say, you're going to be able to do this. Don't worry about it. If they seem to me someone who just, you know, it is hard for them to get, grasp more abstract things uh, at all, then I might counsel them and agree with them that make, doesn't make sense. But the majority of times I have that conversation, I encourage them to stay. And generally, I think I can say without exception, actually, they come back afterwards and say, wow, thank you so much for encouraging me to stay on. I really loved it. And I, I now I know I can do things that I never thought I could do. But you see, that's part of the issue. A lot of the courses are not taught the way I teach. And so if you sit down in a math course, you're not properly prepared, you don't have the support system, and you're not able to follow what's going on from the very first lecture, you're just gonna wash out. And in computer science, if you've had no experience, I mean, it's so frustrating. If you come in as a, I don't know, a freshman, and you sit in comps 131 or whatever appropriate course, you're surrounded by people who, when they were 10, got their first computer and started not just playing video games, but programming them. And then they've gone and done hacking and they are all into the cryptocurrencies and they're part of these communities that are doing machine learning. And you, know, you just have a conversation with them and you freak out. They've got 10 years or eight years of experience and you're just starting to learn Java or MATLAB, oh my God, right? So how does that make you feel? It makes you feel like you're an idiot. So you come into that situation and unless you're a very brave and courageous and persistent person who knows that he or she has to master this material, you're gonna just say, this isn't for me, okay? So again, I think that's part of the reason we have such problems attracting a large number of people. But part of the reason I'm not worrying so much about it is that the major has slowly but steadily gotten slightly larger over the years. And one of the things that I've noticed, which has been wonderful, is that there are usually enough people coming into the key courses that um, those courses have high enough demand that there's no, there's no risk of their getting canceled. So as long as we're able to bring in enough people so that we populate these key courses, the courses will continue. But I go back to this, each student in systems biology is really our best ambassador. And if they want to talk about how wonderful it is and how great it is. Now, don't lie. If you had a miserable time in Bio 300 and you hate 306 and you think that Drs. Chi and Dr. Snyders are only interested in torturing students, then don't invite other people to become part of the major. But if you see us as actually really caring about um, giving students these tools and you can convince your colleagues, your peers, that having those tools would be incredibly valuable, then that could increase the number of majors. I don't think the, the uh, problem is uh, per se the way the major is structured. I think the major has the right things in it. I think that, as I said, the, the Venn diagram of the intersection of those who have biology backgrounds or more abstract backgrounds is small. And so inherently it's a, it's a tough road to hoe. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't have a question, but based on that, I have a small suggestion maybe for those who were to come after us, if you were to ever reconsider adding a course or something. I very much related to your statement of like feeling like an idiot in Java classes because I just wasn't one of those kids. Um, I wish there was a systems biology class that didn't have any prereqs that we could all take when we first started because I think that would have made me a lot happier as a freshman to like know that I had this to look forward to. That would be my only. Uh, so again, look, I can, I'll discuss this with Robin, um, mounting such a course. So uh, the first point I'll make is, I don't know how many of you notice this, Bio 300 has no prerequisites. That's true. Yeah. No prere You can take it as a, I've had high school students take it. 
I think it's um, the 300 that freaks people out because you're a first year in. Yeah, again, at, at most, but I've had freshmen in the class who've done very well. Right, Smiranda? Um, and <laughs> no, it wasn't you, your teammate. Um, and I've had, I've had seniors who've taken the class and who've done very well. And I've even had sometimes graduate students, but I've had high school students have taken it. There are no prerequisites. And that's deliberate. I assume that nobody knows anything when they walk into the classroom. And part of the reason I, I tend to shy away from prerequisites is even when students supposedly have had prerequisites, if you ask them if they know it, they refuse to admit it. They'll recognize it if you actually say things. They'll, they'll, they'll recognize that they actually saw it before, but they don't want to admit it. So um, the problem is who would teach that course? If it was taught by computer science or math people, then they would see it as a remedial course, which would immediately have an, a very serious and probably negative impact on who would take it and how it would be taught. Um, and if it was taught by the biology faculty, then most people who have any kind of interest in, in programming would be leery to learn about programming from a biologist, really? So it's, it's hard to see who would offer that course. The other course that's a way in is the one that Jess Fox teaches on the design of experiments where she teaches MATLAB and she has students actually build little devices and get data and, and, and analyze the data and so forth. So you're learning programming, but you're learning it in a gentle context in which it immediately gives you feedback for something that you are interested in. Um, but your, Jillian, your point is well taken. And there's an advising aspect here, which I should discuss with Robin, which is how, how to get people feeling less scared. I will say this, and again, I, it's not just I'm trying to uh, deflect this, but this, the um, Systems Biology Society could play an absolutely critical role in this. Because if you can get students who are in their freshman year into the society, and then they have a big brother or a big sister, and they, and you can say something, I mean, think of it, Jillian, if you'd had a big sister who said, oh, I felt the same way, and it was very hard. The first month I, I was sure I just couldn't do it, but this is the sorts of things I did. To, that could make a far better impact than we're coming up with a remedial course. Um, and so that's what I would, again, this is not to try to shy away from the responsibility that you're placing upon us, it is, is our responsibility, but this is something that you could really do that would make a big difference. Yeah, that's a that's a big goal of ours. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Well, any other questions? So I would encourage you to perhaps invite uh, Dr. Snyder and do the same thing to her, um, since she's the other creator of uh, uh, of this, and I think that would be that would be very important. Um, and I think um, that would uh, that would also help you give an, another viewpoint, though she is also very focused on dynamics. That's something that she cares about a lot. So I think that 